Hey folks, it's the blind guy here, and yes, I am back from the dead, and I'm gonna turn it up loud inside your head. Yes, now I'm back from the dead, and I'm gonna turn it up loud inside your head. Yes, I was quite ill there for a while. I got to watch some movies though, and thank you guys for your support. I am on the mend, and so I was able to do another good old movie recommendation. This is actually the second time I'm doing this one because I had the microphone too far away from me the first time. So maybe it'll be just that much better. Probably not, though. On this episode, I'm super excited, though, because we are taking a look at one of my personal absolute favorite movies of all time, and that is 1949's The Heiress, starring Olivia de Havilland. Montgomery Clift, and Ralph Richardson. The Heiress is a Victorian-era story about an heiress, hence the name, played by Olivier, Olivia, I can't always want to call her Olivier, Olivia de Havilland, and she is naive and portrayed as being undesirable and somewhat homely, and she can't find a suitor, and then a character comes along, played by Montgomery Clift, who's very good looking, but he's a bit of a wanderlust drifter type, and he begins courting her, and because she's going to inherit a lot of money, she already inherits quite a bit because her mom has passed away. She's going to inherit then twice that much again when her dad passes away, and so her dad is on the lookout for people who are just trying to go after her for her money, and he thinks that's what Montgomery Cliff's character is doing. And that's where the big conflict and the driving force of the movie comes from, is you have this couple that's in love, and her father, who's a doctor, who is not buying it and does not want them to get married. And then you have to start asking, well, what are Montgomery Cliff's character's motivations in this? Is he genuine? Is he sincere? And he plays it very well, and he leaves... Um, a lot for discussion on that side of things. And so it's it's just a fabulous movie. Uh, it was produced and directed by William Wyler. Actually, Olivia de Havilland came, approached him wanting to do a th uh, cinematic um, adaptation of the popular play, The Heiress, which came out in 1947, which was based also on another play called Washington Square. So Olivia wanted to do this movie and William Wyler made it happen. Olivia then subsequently goes on to win the Oscar for Best Actress in this film and it is well deserved. Her character goes from being super naive and sweet and socially awkward to flipping on a switch to, so that you would think they were two different people. I'm serious. She does that good of a job in it. It's a little bit of a famous role for her because of that switch. And it makes you wonder, well, which one is more like the real Olivia? If I were born a hundred years earlier, would hopefully have been my sister-in-law because she is obviously the sister of Joan Fontaine. Don't worry, I'm not going to play the Dreamweaver song. Ooh, Dreamweaver. I believe you can get me. All right, I lied. I had to play it. But yes, they were sisters and they both lived a very long life and they did not like each other. Now, I'm going to actually probably do a video on that because I think it's fairly interesting, their famous feud between each other. But I, I think a little bit of it may have been hyped a bit by the media based on some interviews by Olivia and, and Joan. But that's just one of those famous feuds in Hollywood. I'm glad that they both became actresses because Joan won one Academy Award and Olivia won two. And so they were very well esteemed 
and very talented actresses. I was fortunate enough to watch this movie while I was sick. I'd already seen it before, but I watched it again with my parents. And the movie has a famous twist in it that's pretty difficult to see coming, unless you're my mom. She saw this one coming from a long ways off, but it fooled my dad, so there's that. Now, usually my dad will like any movie, but my mom is a little bit harder to win over, but they both gave it big thumbs up. They both enjoyed it. They thought it was great. It has some funny aspects to it. It has some dramatic elements to it, some heart tugging parts to it. And I think that's one of the things that's hard to put your finger on is it's not a romantic comedy. It's not a romance and it's not a straight up drama. It's kind of a hybrid between them. Let's take a look at a couple of the other things it does extremely well. The direction by Weiler is excellent. It uses a lot of uh, cinematography that you wouldn't have seen necessarily before this, maybe in some film noir movies, but it'll shoot like with a character in the front and the action is happening way behind them, different things like that. You'll have two characters talking and the way he blocks the shot out, it makes it interesting. It's not just sitting and watching two people talk. Uh, Ralph Richardson's character actually played the doctor in the original play in London and they brought him in into the movie to play the same character and he is great in this movie. You can tell he's a theater actor though because he's always doing something with his hands. So in theater, you know, you have to always keep your hands occupied. When you are on film, we've, they only show your hands whenever they need to. So you don't always have to be using your hands. But on the stage, the audience can always see you. And so knowing how to stand and how to use your hands is a big part of being a theater actor. And so Ralph Richardson is excellent at this. If you watch him, he's always fiddling with something, writing, reading through papers. He's always doing something as he's talking. The dialogue is excellent in this movie. It is a bit like a theater play because based on one, it was written by the same people who wrote The Heiress, the play from 1947. So it does at times feel rather scripted, which is common in plays. But it is so well written and so interesting that it's it makes up for it in that regard. Um, it's got, like I said, it's got some funny moments. It's got some very serious moments. But the the dialogue is just back and forth. It's almost like watching a dance at times in the movie. It's great. The only thing that I might not like exceptionally well in the movie, and this is not really anything wrong with it. It's just a fact is that just it's it kind of tugs at uh, the you know believability a bit or uh, stretches your believability a bit when um, you have to sit there and think nobody actually wants to marry Olivia de Havilland. I mean, come on. My mom said she looks absolutely adorable in this. She does. But other than that, the movie is as close to a perfect film as, as I think I've seen. The score is exceptional. Uh, at the beginning, it does something I hadn't seen in a movie. It may have been done before, but it introduces a musical motif on the piano played by Montgomery Cliff. Cliff and, I, and I watched his hands. I think he's actually playing it. Um, he plays a song and sings it. And then early on in the movie, and then after that point during big... Uh, prominent interactions between his character and Olivia's character and, and big parts of the movie, that comes in as a motif in the film score. So it's it's exceptionally done and, and very cool the way they did that. It's done a lot now in movies where they'll introduce a motif and then it, it gets played again. Lord of the Rings did that and things. But this is 1949, and that's not something I'd seen very often, at all, if at all, before that. Another thing that's unique to this movie is the characters are rather ambiguous, whether they are good or bad. Um, and that's unique to the four, unique to this movie in the 40s because in the 40s, you know, your westerns, the good guys wore white cowboy hats, the bad guys wore black cowboy hats. You knew who the good guys were, you knew who the bad guys were. This one's not played that uh, on the nose. You know, you can argue is Montgomery's Cliff Cliff's character really good? Is he really bad? What's What's his actual motivation? He's played much more um, ambiguously than even he was in the 1880s play. They intentionally wrote him, in even out of the 1947 play, they made him more ambiguous. And I think it's it's really cool. And then her dad, you know, her dad is he doing the wrong things for the right reasons? Because if he's right and he believes Montgomery's character is a fortune hunter or a gold digger, 
then should he allow them to get married? Should he not? What should? How much should he control? It's just got some really cool things and some really cool discussions that can come from this movie. Another thing it does uh, exceptionally well is the use of lighting. Early on in the movie, the lighting is very prominent, not front. And then as we see the change in Olivia's character, it's starting to use shadows more. It's shoot, it's uh, contrasting light to dark, something that you can really only do in these black and white films because light becomes almost more like a material that's being used because it's it's either white or black. And so they use it exceptionally well in that. I've seen it that used similar in uh, Notorious without Alfred Hitchcock's movie. But just using light as almost a character in the movie, it's it's done exceptionally well in this movie as well. So it's it's a very cool period piece. Like I said, it takes place in the 1840s. I cannot recommend this enough if, if that time period uh, interests you at all, if more of the dramatic play-style movies interest you at all. This has got to be towards the top of your list. It was uh, uh, extremely influential for modern-day directors, including Martin Scorsese and uh, more of the stylistic guys like that. And so they always mention this as being um, influential towards them. The movie was not uh, well-received when it got, came to theaters. It actually lost money, kind of like Sleeping Beauty. And, I, and we're starting to see a theme there that critical acclaim, it was very highly critically acclaimed. It was nominated for the most Academy Awards that year. But critical acclaim and general audience appeal don't often coincide as much as we would think. In fact, I'd say they almost don't coincide as much as they uh, they actually oppose each other. And so that's just something that happened in this one. It didn't make a lot of money, but today it's considered one of the great classics of all time. It's preserved in the, the film archive by Library of Congress for being aesthetically and historically significant. And just to see Olivia's performance, Ralph Richardson's performance, and Montgomery Cliff's performance, they are all three stylistically as actors very different from each other, but they bring it in this movie. It is uh, exceptionally done and should, probably should be analyzed in any film class or acting class just to see how people can deliver lines and the way they can move and block themselves in shots. It's just so well done. I cannot recommend it enough. And so those are my thoughts on 1949's The Heiress. Uh, if you want to support the channel, you can like, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. You can send us a donation using our Venmo that's in the description. You can watch the movie using the link in the description. But I just uh, thank you guys so much for the support. Our channel has gotten over 100,000 views now. We're approaching that 500 subscriber mark, which is a big milestone because then we can start doing live streams and maybe we can actually like maybe all watch a movie together at the same time. That would be pretty cool. But I just thank you guys so much for all your support. You make this fun. And I'll see you on the next episode of A Blind Guy's View. Laters on the Men, Jay. Laters on the Men, Jay. Ships on bigger on the waves are skimming barren summits to the verdant plains. Each horizon is a new beginning. Ride.